there were very many conversations of me being angry and yelling at God, uh, screaming at the top of my lungs, where are you? If you're real, where are you at? The fear of being abandoned again by someone and just constantly striving to be perfect because I felt that her leaving was my doing. She left because of me. It was profoundly not how life was supposed to, how the world was supposed to be when I had a newborn and my mom wasn't there to help. Regardless of how I was behaving outwardly, inwardly I knew that God loved me and that he didn't want this for my life. And so I, I just, I guess just hoping and praying that something would cause me to want to change. Uh, to see how he's used my, my utter failures and turn it into something that he's using to bring glory to himself, which is pretty amazing. In the last five years, I am a completely different person than I was before. I have really no explanation for that other than God did it. And you can hear me now, hopefully. I was 13 years old, and what I had done was something that I believed had marked me, a mistake that I had made. And it set me on a path that I was never going to recover. I was never going to get past this. This would never be something that I could defeat. I believe this was something that would defeat me. And I believed that lie when I was 13 years old, that I couldn't recover from this. However, the thing that I have come to know is, friends, that because Jesus has defeated the grave, anything's possible. Because Jesus defeated death and rose to life, anything is possible. In your story and in my story, there's... Nothing that could ever come good from this is what I believed. Well, this Resurrection Sunday, this morning, we get the opportunity to celebrate. It's why we're gathered. That Jesus hung on the cross, lifeless, was buried in a tomb and rose to life victoriously. And it's come so that we can now experience this new life, this abundant life within us. And I'm so excited to launch this new message series. It's gonna be an incredible Series And so I hope you'll stick around for the next several weeks as we go through it. Uh, but I'm, I'm very, very expectant for what God has in store and what he wants to speak to each one of you as we go throughout this series. The big idea for this message is this. If you're taking notes, I encourage you to write this down. Because of Christ's resurrection, he has made a way for you to experience new life in him. Because of Christ's resurrection, he's made a way for you to experience new life in him. We're going to start in John's account of the resurrection story in chapter 20. Uh, but before we do that, I just want to pause and I want to pray for us before we jump into God's word. So I invite you to pray with me. Father in heaven, we thank you. Jesus, we thank you that we are here today because you defeated death on our behalf so that we can now experience this resurrection life within you. I believe with all of my heart, Lord, that you have something to speak to each and every one of us. And so as we dive into your word, which is our authority, I pray that you would speak to us, that we would well receive what you have for us, and that we would choose to intentionally take a next step closer toward you today. And so speak to us. You have our attention you have our focus, and I pray that through this time, you would receive the glory and you would speak to us. We love you, and we pray this in the risen name of our Savior, Jesus. Amen. So John chapter 20, if you have your Bibles with you, uh, I'd encourage you to open up to John chapter 20, or you can follow along on the screens uh, as well as we go through this. We're going to read through uh, a decent chunk of this story and then just begin 
going on through the message, but it starts in the very first verse. It says, now on the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene came to the tomb early while it was still dark, saw that the stone had been taken away from the tomb. So she ran and went to Simon Peter and the other disciple, the one whom Jesus loved, and said to them, they've taken the Lord out of the tomb and we do not know where they've laid him. So Peter went out with the other disciple and they were going toward the tomb. Both of them were running together, but the other disciple outran Peter and reached the tomb first. And stooping to look in, he saw the linen cloths lying there, but he did not go in. Then Simon Peter came following him and went into the tomb. He saw the linen cloths lying there and the face cloth, which had been on Jesus' head, not lying with the linen cloths, but folded in a place by itself. Then the other disciple who had reached the tomb first also went in and he saw and believed for as yet they did not understand the scripture that he must rise from the dead. Then the disciples went back to their homes, but Mary stood weeping outside the tomb. And as she wept, she stooped to look into the tomb. She saw two angels in white sitting there where the body of Jesus had lain, one at the head and one at the feet. They said to her, woman, why are you weeping? She said to them, they've taken away my Lord and I do not know where they've laid him. Having said this, she turned around and saw Jesus standing, but she did not know that it was Jesus. Jesus said to her, woman, why are you weeping? Whom are you seeking? Supposing him to be the gardener, she said to him, sir, if you've carried him away, tell me where you've laid him and I'll take him away. Jesus said to her, Mary. She turned and said to him in Aramaic, Rabboni, which means teacher. Jesus said to her, do not cling to me, for I have not yet ascended to the Father, but go to my brothers and say to them, I am ascending to my Father and your Father, to my God and your God. Mary Magdalene went and announced to the disciples, I have seen the Lord, and that he said these things to her. Maybe you've heard this story before, but, but this is the story, it's the reason why we're gathered here. This is the story of the resurrection of Jesus all summed up into a single text. Jesus had been speaking of this moment for years at this point throughout his public ministry, all building up to this very moment that we're here to celebrate today. And to no surprise, it shocked everyone, even those who were walking closest with Jesus. You ever had that moment where somebody describes something and you go, yeah, I think I get it. And then you see it, you, you experience it, you witness and you go, oh, I imagine they had this feeling. It's like, oh, he wasn't kidding. He actually died. We, we witnessed all of it. We saw all of this. And well, now the tomb's empty. So he actually did that. It, this wasn't just a thought. It wasn't an idea. This is reality. This is exactly what had happened. The son of God defeated death and was now fulfilling the promise that he made to make a way through his sacrifice, the sacrifice of his very own life, so that you and I could experience new life within him. However, the question that we may ask is, does this really matter to me? Does this really matter to me at all? What does this person of Jesus have anything to do with me? Does it matter? And so let me just pause and emphatically tell you the answer is yes. The answer is yes, this changes everything. Friends, this means everything for you. Even if you're not at the place yet where you agree with that, that is the truth. This means everything to you. For some of you, you've never placed your faith in Jesus. You may be curious. You may be checking this out. Some of you, you you've heard about it. You've heard the story. You, you've, you've heard about Jesus and, you, and you've decided you know what, I, I, honestly, I'm not sure that that's my thing. Like, I don't, I don't feel like I need that. I seem to be doing fine on my own. And maybe that's where you're at this morning. I can't see why my life needs to be different because of Jesus. And for some of you, as followers of Jesus, this morning's just simply a deep and rich reminder that God is not finished with you, that he's got more for you to experience. There's always more new life that he has and desires for each one of us. So whether you've recognized it yet or not, the truth is that every single 
one of us, you and I both, have a desperate need for Jesus. Every single one of us have a desperate need for Jesus. And the reason why goes all the way back to the beginning of creation in the Garden of Eden. It was the fall of man. And we, we ate of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. We, we wanted to know more. We wanted to experience more, to be more like God. And so humanity fell in that very moment. And now if this is the brokenness in the world that we live in because of that very moment. There was a separation created between us and Christ. And it's because of the sinfulness that lives in our hearts now. There's absolutely no exception to this reality. Not a single one of you, including myself, will break the 100% track record of complete human depravity. Not a single one of us will change that statistic. There's no exceptions to this rule. Romans 3.23, the apostle Paul says this very well here. He says, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. All of us, every single one of us has sinned and fallen short, which means we desperately need a savior. We desperately need a savior who can rescue us because in our own strength, in our own capacity, in our own ability, we can't do that ourselves. Now, this isn't a need. When I talk about a need for a savior, this isn't a need in the way that we oftentimes talk about a need. If you spend time around me, we may be walking around or doing something, you may hear me go, oh, I need that, I need that. I could be talking about who knows what, anything. I say that about lunch about every day, oh, I need that. Which in fairness, I probably do on some level, but, but let's be real, I could, I could miss a few, it's fine. But this need is so different. It's not a need in the way that we use the word need. The reason why we need this is because we can't obtain this on our own, which is really hard for us to wrestle with because we're a very self-reliant people. I can work out whatever. If life is rough, then I'm gonna, I'm gonna be intentional and I'm gonna fix it. I'm gonna work harder. Or I'm, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna put some attention over here. We're used to fixing things ourselves. And, and so we're reliant on ourselves you got to hear me. You can't rely on yourself for this one. You can't rely on yourself for this one. This is a true need that we have. The only way we experience this new life is if we receive what's being offered and extended from Jesus himself. The, the cost of your sinful nature, what that affords us is an eternity in hell. That's, that's what our life actually earns us. You gotta know that that's, that's what we deserve, but that's not what God desires for us. We see in Romans 6, 23, it says, the wages of sin is death. The wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus. Death is what we deserve. Eternal life is what we're being offered and extended. There's a college campus ministry, the Navigators. Uh, they talk about the, the need for Jesus in this way. I love it. They say this, we can't build a bridge to God, but Jesus Christ is God's bridge to us. We can't do anything to get to God ourselves. There's a gap that was created because of the fall of man. There's a gap, and, and I can't get across that gap except through the person of Jesus. He is the only way that I have access to God the Father. So for every single one of us, we have no hope. Absolutely no hope separated from God because of this reality. This is what this means for every single one of us. And it's why God has offered his son, this resurrected Christ that we're here and we're celebrating today. And the truth is this, there's only one way that you and I can find and experience this life. It says this in God's word. Jesus said, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. He says, I am the way, I am the truth, and I am the life. And no one gets to my Father 
unless you come through me. What this means is, again, friends, you can't rescue yourself. You'll never accomplish this on your own. And so if the wages of sin is death, then we have to know death is what we deserve. That's what our life has afforded us. Death is what we deserve, but death is not what Jesus desires for you and I to experience. Scripture says he came so that you and I would have life and have it to the full. What that means is the thing that you're experiencing, I don't know what it felt like for you to show up this morning. I don't know what the last month has been like in your life. I don't know what the last year has been like. I don't know what the last five years has been like. Whether it's good or bad, the truth is Jesus died so that you would receive more, that you would experience more. He has an abundant life for you. And so whatever it is you're experiencing today doesn't begin to scratch the surface of what God has for you. But we only find it through Jesus. It's so important. It is gonna require you and I to receive this gift. God desires us to know him, to have a a deep and meaningful personal relationship with him, to, to experience and find all of the freedom, to receive all the freedom that he has for us. And he desperately wants you to know that he has a purpose on your life. Something far beyond what you may see, what you've ever thought of yourself and your life and your journey. He has more for you. And he desires to now use you to make a difference to your story, into the places that you go, the places that you work, the places that you live. He desires to send you out through his goodness and his resurrection so that you would then be an image bearer of the same resurrection life in your own story, in your own life. He's the only way for us to experience this, and he himself is the bridge that gives us access to God. If you've ever stood up on something high, I can't stand heights. Absolutely don't like them. Uh, Big man doesn't like being up. This is like my limit right here, like two feet. I'm good here. I feel real stable and solid. I don't like heights at all. And what happens when you are standing on something tall, you are at the mercy of the thing that you're standing on. And so if you find yourselves at the top of a ladder, I don't care what weight limit it says, it's like, I think my breakfast is sitting heavy right now. Like that thing's gonna buckle as soon as I get up past like a foot or two feet. But what happens is when you're standing on something tall, whether it's a ladder or a roof or anything that puts you above the ground, you have to place your full trust and weight on that thing. And what happens when we don't trust that thing is I'm trying to figure out how can I get off of this thing? So if I'm on a ladder, all I'm thinking about is like, okay, don't lock your knees, get it together, like get down from this thing because I don't trust the thing that I'm standing on. How many of you, husbands, you get one shot to not mess this up. Do not look at your wife when I say this, but how many of you prefer to drive than to be a passenger? Okay. There's this feeling that you get when you're not behind the wheel. And you go, I, it does, there could be zero cars on the road, and you're like, hey, 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 watch out. You, you want to reach over, and you're like, well, that's not a good idea either. It's so unnerving. We want to be in control. We always want to be in control. We do this same exact thing to God. The very moment that we allow ourselves to not place our full weight on him, We begin taking matters into our own hands. We begin disregarding the foundation and the invitation that he has given us to have access to the Father. When you walk, it requires that you place your full weight on something. I trust the ground that I'm standing on. In effort for us to get to the other side, 
of our story to experience this redemption through Jesus and in our life for us to get to the Father. It requires us to walk across this bridge that's been created for us. And if you are gonna walk across this bridge, it requires that you put your full weight on it. There's no other way that we get to the other side but to place our full dependence and our full weight. It's the only way. It's so, so important. And again, I'll remind us of our big idea this morning. It's because of Christ's resurrection, he has made a way, the only way, for you to experience new life in him. 1 Peter 1.3 says this, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. According to his great mercy, he has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. First Peter says it's his great mercy that's allowed us to be born again and experience the impossible in our lives. It is through this and through this alone, God transforming you and changing your story into a complete story of restoration. And the reality is that this transformation story, it doesn't happen overnight. I find great encouragement in this reality. I don't have to figure it out. I would be toast if I had to figure this out right now. We don't have to figure it out. This is a journey that you and I will walk on as long as we have air in our lungs, as long as we are walking and breathing and living, we'll continue to walk this journey out. And what's so good about that is what that means is all we're being asked to do is to take one single yet intentional next step toward Christ, one at a time. One single next step at a time. And friends, if you'll commit yourself to one single next step at a time. What I can promise you is that at the end of your days, you'll start right where you're at and you will find yourself today and every day in the future at the other side of this bridge. You'll be right next to God the Father and Jesus the victorious if you will take one intentional next step at a time toward Jesus. I can promise you that this is how your life will end if you'll commit to that. It's the greatest thing I could ever imagine for you to experience. It's the greatest thing that I have ever experienced in my life. But friends, you gotta know it's up to you to make this decision. Nobody gets to make this call for you. God will never force you to make this decision. He's so gracious to just simply invite us and invite us and invite us but it's your decision that you have to make. You have to say, I'm choosing to put my full weight on you. I'm choosing to take this bridge so that I can get to the other side of my story. I wanna see what you have in store for me. I wanna know that the pain I experienced has something beautiful to come out of it. But until we take that step, we won't experience the fullness of what God desires and has for you in your life and in your story. The depth of this decision that we make is is us acknowledging the words of the Apostle Paul in Galatians 2.20. He says, I've been crucified with Christ. I've been crucified with Christ. It's no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. In the life I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself up for me. Friends, if you'll make this decision, you don't have to journey alone. One of the greatest gifts that God has given all of us is his people, the church. We have each other, and you you gotta hear me, Walking this journey alone, you will never be as successful as you will if you walk and journey with God's people. We are meant to be together. It's God's design, it's his desire that we would walk with one another because the journey's long, it's hard. 
And it's a constant battle of us releasing what is of our flesh and saying, I'm placing more of my weight on you so that I can get further across this bridge because I deeply desire to be with God the Father, my creator in eternity forever. And because I desire that, I will take these single next steps at a time. If you've never made this decision, I promise you this is your first next step to take. There's no better time than right now to make this decision and say, I'm going to place my weight on Jesus. I want to experience something better in my story. I wanna see what he has for me. I dare you. I dare you. You lose nothing if you say yes and you don't experience something, but you'll gain everything because I promise you, you'll experience what God does and what he has for you. I can promise you that. Allow us as the church to walk and journey with you on this path. We started at the beginning of our time in John chapter 20, and I wanna look at how this ends. Verse 30, it says, Now Jesus did many other signs in the presence of the disciples, which are not written in this book, but these are written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. It's because of Christ's resurrection. He's made a way for you to experience a new life in him. You know what happened when I was 13 years old? The, the thing that I had done that I thought marked me, ruined me, God restored that. God redeemed it completely. And he has allowed me to walk a completely different journey. I am a different man today than I was yesterday, the day before, and 20 years ago because of taking one single next step at a time. I haven't gotten it all right. I still make mistakes like crazy, but I'm committed to placing my full weight and I'm experiencing a different side of my story. And God continues to write new verses and new chapters in my book. And more and more they point to him and they restore what was broken and they've brought healing. It's what he wants to do with you as well. And so I desperately want you to say yes to this invitation. We're a church that takes next steps. Every time that we engage with God's word, it leads us to take a next step. And so I'll invite you to grab a next step card in the seat back in front, uh, just right in front of you. It's a blank card, it says next step across the top. You can write this down or you can snap a photo of the screen, but your next step this week is this. What is it that's keeping me from placing my full weight on Christ? What is it that's keeping me from placing my full weight on Christ? Ask God to answer that question. And as he does, follow up and ask him now, what do I need to do about that? How can I place more of my weight on you, my trust, my faith in you? If you need help,